Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix. This is uh, the second annual genuine tribute to Wes Anderson. How many of you were here last year? They said that it could not be done. And some of you. Um, you have watched these films so many times that uh, you dragged someone here with you. And there's a lot of pressure on that person right now because, because you're not gonna be watching the movie, you'll just be watching them watching the movie. And at the end of it, hopefully you'll still be together. Because Wes Anderson, um, as some of you know, is a religion. Uh, fans are very serious about this, and it's uh, my pleasure to get to present all 10 Wes Anderson films, his eight feature-length movies in 35 millimeter here in the oldest movie theater in San Francisco, the Roxy Theater. Now, some of you who perhaps are coming out to the theater for the first time, uh, it's very important that you um, know a little bit about the history. It's a nonprofit theater. This has been a terrible time uh, for movie theaters staying open across the country. Um, so every time you come out, every time you buy a beer, uh, a popcorn, uh, you're supporting what uh, used to be a major thriving alternative community here in San Francisco. And uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to tell you that we have a new executive director here at the Roxy. I'd like to invite her up onto the stage, Elizabeth O'Malley. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you guys all for being out here. This is amazing to see this house full. I love this. Um, so how many people here are at the Roxy for the first time ever? Yes! Oh my god, I love seeing this! And how many people have been here more than 25 times the Roxy's your life? Yes, I love you people too. <laughs> um, I am so excited to be the ED here at the Roxy. I grew up in the Bay Area and this place means so much to me. Uh, and as Jesse said, by you being here, you're supporting what we do. So we are a nonprofit. We have two programmers who are full time here, independently choosing what to bring to this community and making this your go to place for movies. So there's three ways that you can support what we do coming out here, being here, coming to more shows, buying popcorn, buying beer. This is what keeps us alive. Um, we also have a great membership program, so if you come here all the time, we'd love for you to be a member. It gives you great movie-going benefits. Check that out on our website and become a member here. That is also a tax-deductible donation, so hey, philanthropy. Um, and the last thing is to tell your friends about us and follow us on social media. We post all of our events on Facebook, so Click interested if you're coming, tell your friends about what we do here because movies are our lives and what brings us together and being a part of this community is so exciting. So we're so happy that you're here. Thank you for letting me be here and I look forward to seeing you all at the Roxy again soon. Thanks. Give it up for Liz a little bit. 
it's really important to have somebody, a leader, who is going to help out. And those of you that work at nonprofits and are still kicking around in San Francisco and haven't moved to Oakland, um, it, this, is, this is a crucial time. So uh, it's wonderful to see Wes Anderson films sell out. As I said, these are all 35 millimeter prints. And for some of us that um, don't care about that, uh, you're going to learn why it's so uh, special. We actually have a projectionist up here in the booth, Carl. Can you give it up to Carl? Uh, and like many of you, you are uh, cinephiles. Like, you, you are obsessed with movies. You wake up in the morning to see what films are playing, and you schedule your life and your work schedule around movies, not the other way around. And um, to see a film that you probably watched when it came out, uh, The Grand Budapest Hotel. How many of you have never seen the film before? Raise your hand proudly. How many of you have seen this movie more than five times? Okay. Now the thing with Wes Anderson movies, and for those of you who got dragged here today, um, is that they really do benefit with multiple screenings. And so whatever you thought about the Grand Budapest Hotel when it came out, uh, it was Wes Anderson's most successful film financially. Uh, it was nominated and won Academy Awards. Uh, somehow this film was the big crossover. And what's curious about it is that uh, I don't think people really understand it. When I talk to them, uh, they, they seem to like it. They, they had a good time. And, um, and then they have the audacity to say that somehow Wes Anderson is um, very carefree and his movies are really quirky and they don't really have a lot of substance to them. And um, they're not here, which is okay. Uh, you are. Uh, but it's one reason why I think it's important to try and talk about things that you love. Um, I'm hoping that some of you will write about the Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, I couldn't think of a better movie to start off as the opening night film with uh, because it in fact is so timely. Uh, it is complex, it is political, it is emotional. This is not style over substance. In fact, uh, the film can bring you to some very dark and deep emotions. Um, and those of you who have rewatched it, you know what I'm talking about. And so uh, there's a lot of pressure on those of you who have never seen it because uh, he's got real style. And when we talk about style, I teach film history at the Academy of Art, and I want to bring up a couple of filmmaker names uh, for you to follow up on. Someone like Alfred Hitchcock. Um, that's a name that's thrown around a lot of us. We were not even alive when Alfred Hitchcock was making movies. And uh, so then, I don't want you to ever think you were supposed to have watched an Alfred Hitchcock movie. This is a perfect place for you to start is that there are many references and influences uh, throughout the Grand Budapest Hotel, and it's not, I'm not just talking about Vertigo, I'm talking about, in fact, his British films that he was making in the 1930s, uh, The 39 Steps, so The Lady Vanishes. Uh, these movies are not old, and when people talk about cinema, I don't, I don't ever hear anyone say that Beethoven is old music. It's, uh, it's classical music, and Alfred Hitchcock's films are just as vibrant and disturbing, and. Uh, complex as they were when they were made, if not more so. And so to know that Wes Anderson has grown up with those movies, uh, that he's infused a lot of that vocabulary into his films. Second filmmaker would be Ernst Lubitsch. And uh, those, I have some students here tonight who are getting extra credit uh, to come out to see Wes Anderson. Uh, because he has primarily worked within a genre called a screwball comedy. And a screwball comedy is very different than slapstick or just straightforward. Uh, he likes to take things to the extreme, where it feels ridiculous. And this is one reason why that he has a lot of uh, fans and then also has a lot of haters. Uh, because the movies, they don't feel realistic. They don't feel like they're based in some sort of reality, so this movie must be fucking stupid. And uh, I can't tell you how many times the debate of Wes Anderson has happened and will continue to happen. Um, because people are not recognizing this idea of a screwball comedy. When things feel ridiculous, there actually might be something subversive. There might be something that is so complex, right, just right underneath the surface. We're going to see if we're going to uncover this. Now there's a slew of actors throughout this movie, and something that Wes Anderson does is that he gives uh, genuine characters 
to those actors. They're not just playing themselves. And so if you can get past Jason Schwartzman <laughs> and getting excited about seeing uh, a lot of his regulars, like, uh, can we give it up for Owen Wilson? If you can get past just noticing that they're in them and then telling your friend, that's Tilda Swinton, I love her. <laughs> uh, then you can start to see how he might be utilizing those actors' personas against themselves or in a new way or particularly for the film. Uh, I have a fondness, which I'm sure many of you do, for uh, Willem Dafoe. Can you give it up for this guy? And these are things that you can learn every time you watch the movie. The star of the Grand Budapest Hotel is... Rafe. It's, it's Rafe Fiennes. And uh, this performance, it, it truly went unnoticed, underrated. Uh, it's a spectacular performance and I'm so excited that so many of you have packed this house to see a film, as you already know, multiple times. Um, could you pull out your ticket stub, which is actually a raffle ticket. Now part of Wes Anderson's appeal for many of us is uh, how homemade his movies are. Um, not only in the way that he writes and directs them, not only in the consistent themes, but also in the tactile uh, ingredients that he uses. This ticket is very different than many of the tickets you're getting these days. This is something that you can save, you can put it in a scrapbook, you would literally be in the movie Moonrise Kingdom if you were collecting things like this. And it's uh, part of the interest that Wes Anderson has carried over into this new generation of computers is actually owning stuff and treasuring them. And uh, like many of you have in your own houses, you probably have this thing called a bookshelf that you put books on. And you probably have records and perhaps you have sewing materials uh, all of these physical items, uh, this is one reason why I make these tickets homemade. My mom was a paper arts, creative arts teacher, and she passed that on to me. And now I'm passing these tickets on to you, and there is a raffle number in the top right-hand corner. You're looking for your individual number. Because the series is co-presented with Spoke Art. Spoke Art Museum is right out here. Uh, some of you have been avidly supporting this beautiful... Um, art exhibit. Um, Wes Anderson has been working with, or Spoke Art has been making Wes Anderson art for almost half a decade already. Uh, we have a new poster right here. Max Dalton created this, who is the sign signature Wes Anderson designer. He's done all of the books. He's working on the brand new book with Wes Anderson uh, for his new movie, which is called Hey, come on down. Come here. Isle of Dogs. Beautiful. Now, forgetting this, uh, Spoke Art has created a whole lot of exciting um, pins and patches today, rings, in fact. And I want to give you, for getting that right, oh, yeah, come on up. Love it. We're going to give you a Grand Budapest Lobby Boy pin right here. And I'm going to give you a, a double key cross ring right there. Give it up right here. You're welcome. Okay, so you've got a number. I want number uh, 182 to come on up. Number 182, where are you? Where's 182? I'm not gonna come to you. Do you want something? Come on down. Give it up for number 182. Now I'd also like to give a uh, number, let's see, number um, 112. 112. Where is 112? Come on down. Now for getting this, you could either have a ring, what does this say? Uh, Camp Ivanhoe Khaki Scouts. It's got like a little uh, raccoon on it. Do you want a ring or do you want a Grand Budapest pin? You want the ring. There you go. Give it up right there. Is this 112? Okay, I want number 40 to come on up. There you go, Grand Budapest pin. Where's number 40? Hey, there you are. Love it. Next, I would like number um, 99. Where's number 99? Come on down. 
Hey, look at this. This is exciting. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's completely for you, right? Yeah. So for getting that right, I'm going to give you... What this is, is uh, we've got a little box filled with patches. Oh. Eight different patches from the Grand Budapest Hotel. Awesome. There you go. You're welcome. What number are you? You're number 99? Look what you get. So we sell all of this stuff out here. I hope that it worked. Uh, because um, it's just as difficult to run a museum as it is to run a movie theater. And Ken is doing a wonderful job. Can you give it up for this guy? That you don't know him. Uh, but all of this is truly homegrown. It means so much to come out to the Roxy. If you could pull out your cell phones and turn them off. Uh, I've said this before, but Wes Anderson fans will beat you up if you uh, distract them while they're watching a movie and pulling out your cell phone most definitely does. You have nowhere else to go. You're going to get caught up in this truly layered postmodern film that is based on the writings of... Stefan Zweig. Hey, very nice. Stefan Zweig. Now raise your hand. Where are you? Okay, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you something. You, you, <laughs> you sit tight. Um, now there's a couple of trailers before this movie. Uh, Midnight's for Maniacs were doing uh, monthly events, right? So next, next month in October is a genuine tribute to Tom Waits. Uh, and this uh, underground folk uh, beat Nick singer has been around for quite some time and we're playing a movie called Down by Law directed by Jim Jarmusch uh, from the 1980s. Uh, as well as a documentary about Tom Waits' uh, performance that he did in the late 80s that has never been officially released in the United States, so we have tickets for that. Uh, and we are also announcing today, Spoke Art and Midnight's Maniacs will be doing a series for the Coen Brothers, um, who very much like Wes Anderson has their own language. Um, and uh, you'll get to see a couple of trailers perhaps for those if you come back every single day this weekend. <laughs> My name is Jesse Atherin Fix. Thank you so much for coming out. This is Midnight's Remix. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone. My name is Jesse Atherin Fix. This is Midnight's for Maniacs. And this is the second annual Wes Anderson. Can you please give yourselves a round of applause for a sold out screening? Now we've got a ton of people in uh, line for the bathroom, for the snacks, for all of our wonderful um, posters and rings and patches that Spoke Art has created and brought over uh, just for this weekend. Um, in fact, last year, which we had all of our screenings sell out as well, uh, Wes Anderson was quite excited to hear that um, people are still interested in his cinema. Uh, which is going, getting close to 25 years of creation. Some of you, you are um, you're just being introduced to it, and others, you've been around since the very beginning. Uh, how many of you, in fact, are going to come to another screening this weekend? Raise your hand. Beautiful. Now, the rest of you, you can still get some tickets. Um, tomorrow, we have the fantastic Mr. Fox, followed by the Darjeeling Limited. Different woos there. Uh, and at 9 o'clock is the Royal Tenenbaums, which um, is sold out. But uh, as you see, we always have a handful of seats that if you want to come out and rush the, the screening, you can stand outside for about 15 minutes before the, the film starts. Now on Sunday, uh, we kick things off with the Life Aquatic with Steve Zazu. Isn't it interesting? It's different fans for different movies. Um, which is then followed by Rushmore. We still have tickets for Rushmore, as well as we still have some tickets for Bottle Rocket. Now, as I said, Wes Anderson has been making movies for close to 25 years, and um, I'd like to I'd like to share with you that uh, as a 17-year-old, I was at the Sundance Film Festival, and uh, two kids came up to me. Uh, they were kids because I was a kid, and um, they gave me a flyer and they had their flyer pinned to the back of their backpack. And uh, they said, 
uh, you know, you should come to my short film. And the other guys, it's like, no, it's my short film. And they were uh, quite charming and entertaining. And um, I went to a shorts program just because of these two guys. And it turned out that that was Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson um, as kids, right? And that's where they started, was making a short film, uh, which was called Bottle Rocket. And we will be showing that original short film on Sunday, which then turned into the feature length version of Bottle Rocket two years later, which then two years later was Rushmore. And, now we're uh, here at 9.45 at night watching Moonrise Kingdom. Now how many of you have never seen Moonrise Kingdom? Raise your hand proudly. <laughs> Wonderful. That means someone dragged you here tonight, right? Uh, we just had a huge group of sold out audience members for the Grand Budapest Hotel. Can we give it up for this amazing film? Which, as I said at the previous screening, watching a Wes Anderson movie more than once uh, makes it better. Uh, his films, they're fast, they are um, layered, they're dense, they, they seem like they're a lot of style, and in fact, when you dig past that style, there is quite a lot of substance. Now, um, I teach film history at the Academy of Art University, and there is a huge debate uh, over this past 12 years that I've been teaching, there are a lot of people that fucking hate Wes Anderson. And I'm sure that you have run into some of them. Um, I have some students who are here for extra credit tonight. Um, and uh, something that you need to remember is that, um, I am gonna out them in a little bit. Uh, this new batch of students are 18 years old, which means they were born in 1999. <laughs> now don't worry, students. All of those people making noises are just really old. <laughs> now if, um, if they started watching movies at a very young age, which a lot of you, you did as well, your cineph cinephiles, uh, you get up in the morning to watch cinema, you stay up late. Um, movies, they, they give you more energy as opposed to uh, leave you exhausted and tired like some of you will be tonight. Um, this type of experience is in fact uh, something that maybe kicked into gear around 12, 12 or 13. You found cinema, you found movies, you found music. Uh, that means that my students started watching in 2012. So that's where the reference points are. And, and I think this is really important for everyone in this room to recognize is that you grew up during a certain time in a certain place and those were the movies that you watched. Now maybe you started dating someone who was a lot older than you and so they started to show you the good shit, right? <laughs> and then you started to expand a little bit. But but this is what makes Wes Anderson so important, is that he, he has studied all of those old movies as well. And he doesn't consider them old-fashioned, and he, in fact, is uh, redoing them. He's uh, paying homage to them. He's remaking them in a way without having to uh, completely copy it. And so the vocabulary of Wes Anderson is often from a different time period. And so a lot of us in this room, we did not grow up during the time period of Moonrise Kingdom, and yet we feel very nostalgic towards it. And um, in the previous screening, I was talking about how some of you, you like to read books as opposed to read it on your iPad. You like to listen to music on records. You like to sew. You like to, um, in fact, you like paper arts. You like to create things that uh, aren't digital. And so if you could, I'd love for you to take out your raffle ticket that I, I made this, so, right? Like, I'm, I made this. And I, I can say that my mom taught me these paper arts. Uh, she was a uh, arts and crafts teacher. And uh, these are things that are sort of slipping through the cracks as we move into the next generations. And um, Wes Anderson has consistently uh, celebrated this type of uh, universe. So this paper ticket stub, has a number on it. Top right hand corner, that's your raffle number. Now back in the days, back when they used to show movies as double features, uh, they would try and give away 
anything to get you to come to the movies, as opposed to just stay at home. You could have watched Moonrise Kingdom, I'm sure, on your Blu-ray that you worn out already, or you don't even have a Blu-ray because you just have some Netflix account that's not even yours because you're so fucking cheap and you're going to just watch somebody else's account. And that's why it's very special for you to be here in the oldest movie theater of San Francisco. Can you give it up for the Rock City Theater? And you spent hard-earned money to, uh, in fact, see a 35 millimeter print that is projected by our projectionist, Carl, up here in the booth. <laughs> it's a thankless job, because if anything goes wrong, then we are gonna be angry at him. Um, but in fact, it's like going to a museum and seeing the actual painting, uh, as opposed to a copy of it. And so when you watch this 35 millimeter print, you may see some scratches, in fact, you're gonna see up here in the right-hand corner, just where your number is on your ticket, is a cigarette burn, as they're called, because each reel is gonna change every 20 minutes, and he's gotta be on the job, as opposed to just pressing a button and letting the film play, to transition each of these film reels that had to be shipped and had to be taken care of and cleaned. And All right, I wanna give you some free stuff. <laughs> for this raffle, because it is the tradition of going to the movies uh, and hopefully making a new best friend. Um, and then maybe, as Folk Art, our museum, who is helping co-present this, has made a limited edition alternative art poster for our Wes Anderthon here that has multiple characters throughout all of his films, created by Max Dalton. And he has been working with Wes Anderson on all of his books recently. So if you own any of those books, the art is by Max Dalton. He's working on Wes's new film, which is called Isle of Dogs. Very nice. We'll be including that in the third annual Wes Anderson next year, hopefully. But what I'd like, in fact, is number 13 to come on up. Number 13. Oh, yeah, keep it up for number 13. Now this is how you should come out to a movie. Sam, you want to come on down? Now I'm betting that these two have seen the film before. Are you gramming this shit? Come on. All right, so forgetting this, uh, what we have here is a Moonrise Kingdom button set, which you don't need. <laughs> We've got a limited edition uh, Moonrise Kingdom pin. And we've got a Wes Anderson poster. all weekend. Uh, Midnight's for Maniacs is a series that celebrates underrated and overlooked films. Now I know that Wes Anderson might not be underrated and overlooked for you, uh, but his movies, they don't actually make a lot. And um, the cult that has followed him is not just because these movies are quirky and funny, uh, is that they mean a lot to you. Um, they actually, they touch the childhood that perhaps you've already lost, and they are laying a blueprint. Are you listening to me on this? for what you might become as an adult. And it's happening at the same time when you watch these movies. It's not just about kids, it's also about the adults that are trying to raise those kids who used to be adults and are probably still kids. And it's beautiful art. And it means a lot to me that you would come out to the Roxy Theater to watch a 35 millimeter print of a movie you've probably already seen. Um, we are following this film series with a tribute to the Coen brothers who do often very similar things of studying history, making it enjoyable, and perhaps uh, leaving you with something profound as you leave the theater. Now I've put together a couple of trailers before Moonrise Kingdom of some very offbeat 
preteen films from the 1970s and 80s that Wes Anderson was inspired by for this movie, Moonrise Kingdom. You guys, my name is Jesse Altman Fix. Thank you so much for coming out.